our next speaker, which is going to be Uwe Waldman. And the, the talk is a comprehensive framework for saturation theory improving, and it's joint work with uh, Sophie Tourette, Simon Lobia, and uh, Jospin Blanchet. Thanks for the introduction. So this talk is about a comprehensive framework for saturation theory improving. And this is a joint work with Sophie, Simon, and Jasmo. We know that typical automatic provers for full fast order logic implement saturation calculi. And saturation calculi work like this. They take as input a set n of formulas, and then they compute, for instance, resolution inferences with premises in the set of formulas and add the conclusions to the set, or they delete redundant formulas from the set of formulas. And they do this until they either reach a saturated set or until they derive a contradiction. Okay, abstractly, we can describe this by a tuple consisting of an inference system and a redundancy criterion. The inference system tells us what we have to compute and the redundancy criterion tells us what we have, what we may delete. And saturation depends on both inf and red. Okay, so if we have such a tuple in red, we would like to know whether it's dynamically, refutationally complete. I will typically omit the word refutationally. So what does dynamic completeness mean? It means that whenever we have some inconsistent set of formulas, then every fair derivation starting with the set of formulas will, will eventually derive the contradiction. Okay, in order to prove this, one typically proves something else first, namely a property called static completeness. Static completeness means the following. Whenever we have a saturated set, a set where we have computed sufficiently many inferences, and the set is inconsistent, then it must contain the empty clause. And there is a nice theorem due to Bachmeier and Gansinger that shows that these two properties are in fact equivalent for arbitrary inference systems and, re and redundancy criteria, provided that all formulas that are deleted in these derivations are redundant. Okay, well, the first property is static completeness still needs a calculus dependent proof. So this can be more or less work depending on the calculus. Okay, that's all nice. But what we are really interested in is whether a prover implemented, implementing this inf and red is dynamically complete, which means if I have a prover that implements inf and red and we give it, uh, give it as input an inconsistent set of formulas does it derive bottom, the empty clause? False. Okay, now all practical provers delete subsumed formulas as one of the operations. And now there is a problem. Subsumption is not fully covered by usual, by usual redundancy criteria. There is a second problem. Practical provers work not only on one set of formulas, but in several formula sets like active and passive, and they even treat them differently when checking subsumption. Okay, so this is not immediately applicable. What's the problem here? The problem is the following. The standard definition of redundant clauses looks like this. We say a clause is redundant with respect, to, with respect to a set N of clauses, if every ground instance C theta of C is entailed by smaller ground instances of clauses in N. Okay, so what do we do if we have, if we have subsumed clauses? Well, we have some clause C and we have some clause of the form C sigma or D, which means some instance of the C plus additionally, plus a post plus potentially 
additional literals. And then it's clear that every ground instance of C sigma or D is entailed by a ground instance of C. However, if this D part is empty, then this is not a smaller ground instance, but an equal size ground instance. And as a consequence, our nice theorem that gives us the equivalence of static and dynamic completeness is not directly, directly applicable, which means instead of an equivalent sign, we have a big question mark at this point. There is one publication that really does this part. It proves that a particular prover implementing a particular calculus is dynamically complete. And that's in the Handbook of Automated Reasoning by Bachmeier and Gansinger. The problem is that they essentially omit this middle step and start with a static completeness proof for the ground case and then consider um, simulations of derivations on the ground level uh, and on the non-ground level. And the proof is very non-modular. So it mixes the simulations. It talks simultaneously about fairness, about prover rules and about lifting. Okay, the question is, is there a nicer way to do it? We will show the following. Every redundancy criterion that is ever used in practice can in fact be extended to a redundancy criterion that also permits the deletion of subsumed formulas. And more, it can be extended to a redundancy criterion that permits to model typical prover transitions. And as a consequence, we get a fully abstract framework where we can prove generically the refutation of completeness of a prover architecture that is to be instantiated by an arbitrary calculus. Okay, how do we do it? We start completely abstractly. So we just have some set of formulas which are abstract entities here. So we don't assume any structure of these formulas. We only assume that there is some false formula contained. Okay, and we assume that there is some consequence relation on formulas with the usual properties. So for instance, it should be transitive and some more. Uh, we have F inferences, which are, just, which are just tuples of formulas. The last element in this tuple is the conclusion and the remaining components are the premises. An inference system it's just a set of F inferences, a set of tuples. <coughs> and we denote the set of all inferences in inf, where the premises are contained in some set N as inf N. Okay. Now we can define what redundancy means. A redundancy criterion maps a set of formulas to a set of redundant inferences and to a, to a set of redundant formulas. And these net need to satisfy certain properties. Namely the following. Well, first of all, deletion of redundant formulas should not destroy unsatisfiability. So if we start with an inconsistent set of formulas N and we, re and we delete redundant formulas from N, then the remaining set should still be inconsistent. Second, we need some monotonicity properties, namely the following. Whenever we add something to a set of formulas, then everything that was redundant before should be redundant afterwards. And that applies to both inferences and formulas. Similarly, whenever we delete some set of redundant formulas from N, then everything that was redundant before should be redundant afterwards. And finally, there should be some way to make an inference constructively redundant, namely by adding its conclusion to the set of formulas. So whenever the, the conclusion is already contained in the set N, then the inference should be redundant. Okay. We can use these properties to define 
red derivations. So a red derivation is just a finite or infinite sequence with a property that everything that gets deleted during this derivation is redundant with respect to the remaining formulas. So whenever some formula is contained in Ni, but no longer contained in Ni plus one, then it must be redundant with respect to the formulas in Ni plus one. We can define the, we can define the limit of such a sequence which is the set of persistent formulas. We can define fairness, we say that a, a derivation is fair if every inference from persistent formulas is redundant at some point of the derivation. And we can define saturation in the following way. We say that a set of formulas is, is saturated if every inference from the formulas in N is redundant with respect to the formulas in N. A small side remark, if you look into the literature, there are several definitions of fairness and of saturation. They're always slightly different, but it turns out that one can prove that they are ultimately all equivalent when it comes to refutational completeness. So it's not necessary to pick any of the more complicated definitions. This one is the most easy and we take that one. And we emphasize that this definition of saturated form, saturated sets has the property that it does not depend on redundant formulas. So the definition only refers to redundant inferences, not to redundant formulas. Okay. In practice, <clears throat> the static refutation of completeness is always proved using some mapping to ground formulas and inferences. So using some lifting process. So we have formulas and another set of formulas, let's say ground formulas. We have an inference system on F and an inference system of, on G. And now we have a grounding function that maps formulas to sets of ground formulas and that maps inferences to sets of ground inferences. And we just need very few properties here. In particular, the grounding function should map, uh, should map false to false. And it uh, should have the property that all ground instances of an inference are redundant with respect to the ground instances of the conclusion of the inference. We don't need anything more than these two properties. Okay. Typically, uh, now the redundancy uh, criterion for the ground inference system is lifted to the non-ground inference system in the following way. Let's say we have some set of formulas N and a, claw, and a formula C and an inference iota. Then we say that an inference a general inference is redundant with respect to N event only if all its ground instances are redundant with respect to the ground instances of N. And similarly, a clause is redundant with respect to N event only if every ground instance of C is redundant with respect to the ground instances of N. Okay. What we do now is we just add one more condition to the definition of redundant formulas. We take an arbitrary well-founded ordering on F, a so-called tiebreaker ordering. And we extend this definition in the following way. We say a clause is redundant if and only if every ground instance of it is either redundant with respect to the ground instances as before, or if it is also a ground instance of some other formula that is smaller than C with respect to the tiebreaker ordering. And C prime should also be contained in it. Note that we keep the definition of redundant inferences invariant. We only have one more case for the definition of redundant formulas. Okay. It is 
Uh, so the typical choice for this tiebreaker ordering is the instantiation ordering. So a C is greater than a C sigma, if sigma is not a Riemannian. This uh, makes strictly subsumed formulas are redundant. So it solves our problem. There's one restriction. This, was, this works only if the instantiation ordering itself is well-founded for the set of formulas, and that need not be the case. So in particular for constraint clauses or for higher order clauses, this ordering is in, is in fact not well-founded, but we can take some other ordering that works here. Okay, it's relatively easy to show that this is again a redundancy criteria. One and one and a half pages, not very difficult. And now we use this fact. We start with our statically complete inference system and the original lifted redundancy criteria. Okay. Now we add this tiebreaker ordering and note that saturation depended only on this part. And this part is unchanged. And static completeness depends only on saturation. And therefore the static completeness of this carries over immediately, immediately to the static completeness of the new system. Moreover, this is again a redundancy criterion and therefore static and dynamic completeness are equivalent. And now we have a redundancy criterion that in fact permits the deletion of subsumed formulas whenever they are smaller with respect to the tiebreaker. Okay, that's nice but we would like to have some more. We would like to model concrete prover architectures. And it's just a small change. What, what is the new problem? Well, we now have several sets of formulas, for instance, unprocessed, passive, given, active in some Otter loop prover. And we just map these sets to one set of labeled formulas. So instead of uh, C is containing unprocessed, we write the labeled clause C with the label unprocessed is contained in N. C is in passive, is mapped to C with the label passive is contained in N. Note that we completely ignore these labels whenever we compute inferences or whether when we check redundancy and we also ignore it in the grounding function. So these labeled functions these, these labeled formulas are mapped to the ground instances of the original C by G. What do we get? Well, let's start again with a statically complete inference system and redundancy criteria. Now we have labels. And since the labels are completely ignored in the inference system and in the redundancy criterion, nothing changes. So the static completeness here is equivalent to the static completeness there. Now we may again add some tiebreaker ordering, but now we have labels here. And of course, the tiebreaker ordering can be, can be defined in an arbitrary way on these labeled formulas. In particular, it may now refer to labels but it's, it's still a tiebreaker ordering. So we get the same result as before. Since the redundant inferences are, in, are unchanged, uh, we have static completeness here, and that implies static completeness there. Now we have again the, the equivalence of static and dynamic completeness, which means this is also dynamically complete. And now we have something that can actually be used to model realistic proofs. How does that work? Very easy. We define our tiebreaker ordering on labeled formulas as the lexicographic combination of the instantiation ordering on the formula part and of an ordering on labels in which say unprocessed is larger than passive, which is larger than given, which is larger than active. And it turns out this is completely sufficient to model prover transitions. So here's an example. 
let's say we have forward subsumption in a prover that uses sets unprocessed passive, given, and active. So forward subsumption does the following. It takes a formula from unprocessed, and whenever this formula from unprocessed can be written as d sigma or d prime for some d which is either passive or active, then we just delete it. In terms of labeled formulas, what happens is, well, we have the labeled formula C unprocessed and we delete it. And we may do this because this labeled formula is redundant with respect to either D passive or with respect to D active. Either because the D prime part is non-empty, then it's standard redundancy. Or if the D prime part is non-empty, then because of the instantiation ordering. And if the sigma part is a renaming, uh, then because of the ordering on labels in which unprocessed is larger than passive or active. So in any case, we get something smaller. Similarly, an operation like choosing a given clause is permitted by the redundancy criterion. We move some clause from passive to given. In terms of labeled clauses, we remove C comma passive and we add C comma given. And C passive is redundant with respect to C given. So all operations that we have in the prover are really permitted by the redundancy criterion. That means we get a following framework for saturation theorem proving. Let's start with the statically complete inference system and redundancy criterion. We can move to a labeled inference system and a labeled redundancy criterion where we now make use of the labels and where we handle subsumption. We have seen that this is dynamically complete. And now, we can uh, uh, construct abstract provers in such a way that every derivation step here is a derivation step within this system. So we can, for instance, define a general given clause prover. Looks like this. I will not go into the details, but it's just two inference rules that we have here. We can also define some lazy given clause prover that also permits often deletion. And we can further instantiate these abstract provers and get, let's say, an otter loop prover or a discount loop prover in the style of E or a zipper position, pro zipper position loop prover that permits to handle infin infinitary inferences. And because this is, dynamic, this is dynamically complete, and these are just subcases of this. This is dynamically complete. And because these concrete provers are instances of LGC and GC, they are also dynamically complete. The only thing that remains to be shown is that we have fairness for these prover architectures. So what we get is a, gener a generic completeness proof for a prover description. Whenever we have a statically refutationally complete inference system and redundancy criterion, where this is obtained by lifting from some ground, redund ground redundancy criterion, and if the instantiation ordering is well-founded, and if the prover is an instance of GC or LGC for some label set L, and implements this infrared, and is fair, then the prover derives bottom from any inconsistent input. Okay, conclusions. We have shown that redundancy criteria can be extended to permit subsumption deletion. This is fully abstract. It works for arbitrary saturation calculi. It handles not only calculi, but we get parametrized, parametrized proofs for concrete prover descriptions, and the whole thing has to be formalized and proved correct in Isabel Hall, and you get it as part of the ISA 4 framework. 
What remains to be done? Well, we should instantiate the formalized framework with the, with the concrete calculus, this is still missing. And the one thing that we cannot yet handle is prove architectures with splitting or arata, stuff like that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Uwe, for a very nice talk. Uh, we are now ready to get some questions from the audience, maybe. Uh, maybe I can start, but uh, I was always curious uh, when I was uh, looking into the handbook chapter of, uh, of this, uh, when this redundancy is formalized, is there a case, I know that in your work, there is now a case because you used the argument several times in the slides already, but uh, I was always confused why there is redundant inferences and redundant formulas. Okay, what? I was thinking maybe isn't redundant inference always only an inference whose conclusion is redundant with respect to the set of clauses? Can we just get rid of that with Occam's razor and have something no, much simpler? No, it's not. In fact, there are some typical um, uh, simplification techniques that are not covered by redundant formulas. So, for instance, one knows that after a superposition inference, one uh, where one replaces some t sigma by a t prime sigma in the second premise, one can in fact replace every occurrence of t sigma by t prime sigma in the conclusion, and that holds also if uh, t sigma and t prime sigma are in fact incomparable. So this is not a simplification of the conclusion. It is not, it is not covered by redundant clauses, but we have a guarantee that it makes the inference redundant. The original one. The original inference. So a redundant formula is a formula that we don't need. And a redundant inference is an inference where we need at least, where at least we don't need this particular way to derive the conclusion, but we might need some other uh, inference that gives us the same conclusion. We don't know. Okay, this is a very interesting answer and I hope Bernhard Gleis is listening because we have discussed something, exactly this example that you just gave was, was we had discussed last week for a different reason, but uh, we were also wondering what, what, how one actually proves that this is, this is okay. Uh, so, so thank you for an interesting answer. Do we have any more questions? Uh, Nobody is raising hands. I don't see any. Well, obviously, I'm also interested in the in the splitting slash avatar uh, conundrum or or project because uh, we know that uh, well we we know that we don't know. <laughs> and that the way Avatar is implemented in Vampire could be violating fairness in some subtle way, but uh, we think it's okay and we cannot prove it's okay. <laughs> well, fairness is always the thing that we cannot handle generically, mm. right? So fairness needs to be proved for a particular prover architecture. Yeah, okay. Everything uh, else is gone for free. We get everything else for free. Maybe, maybe your framework now makes the investigations on a very formal level more accessible to others as well. We have a question from Constantin, if I'm not mistaken. Sorry, just since no one asks questions. Maybe can you comment about orphan elimination? Sorry. Well, often uh, elimination, ah, okay, let me go to the, uh, let me go to this part. Okay, so this is the um, given cross prover, just to inference rules one that handles almost everything, in particular the, the transfer from a clause, from a clause set to a lower clause set, and one more inference rule that uh, computes inferences. And if you want to model orphan deletion, you replace this uh, inference rule that computes inferences by two, in, by, uh, two separate inference rules, one that schedules an inference and one that actually computes it. So we have a to-do list of inferences that are still to be done. Schedule infer just puts, it puts an inference there and compute infer 
takes an influence from the to-do list and does it. And at any point, we are allowed to delete inferences from the to-do list if the premises of this inference are no longer contained in the active set. And this is the easy way to handle orphan deletion on the abstract level. In the concrete implementation, uh, how we implement this to-do list, to-do list differs on the details of the implementation. So it can really be an inference stored in some abstract way as in Waldmeister. It can be the conclusion or the pre-simplified conclusion in, of the inference as in E. It can be a, a list of streams as in zipper position. There are many possibilities. The key point is delete orphans, just delete something from the to-do list. Yes, so question here is that, um, as I understand, uh, the conclusions of potential orphans are not, can, be, can they be used for simplifications or not? Well, if you, so you don't, you, don't you, you postpone these inferences. Exactly. Yes. If uh, we but, want to but then you cannot use them for, for simplifications. Right. If we want to use them for simplification, then we have to compute the inference. Theoretically, it would be possible yeah, to... In some, in some proofs, the approach is to mark, yes. like for example, clauses that are used for simplifications and so yes. on. Is that ever implemented anywhere? Or is it just it a night night or, uh, What? At some point. Yeah. I'm, I'm sorry, I need to interrupt this. Uh, Okay. But the uh, more technical details need to be postponed for, for, uh, for later. Okay. Uh, thank you, Uwe, once more for an interesting talk.